This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Be one of the first 200 to sign up at the link below to get 20% off your annual premium subscription. It all sounds so simple. Sit down and do the work. But it isn't, is it? Ever since you merged your workspace with your living space, ever since the days began to bleed into one another in an undifferentiated cycle of light and dark, ever since your social interactions moved to small, fake islands, you haven't been able to focus. Shia's impassioned calls to action fail to stir you. And you're starting to wonder if you'll ever be able to concentrate or get anything worthwhile done ever again. This is really dramatic, isn't it? <clears throat> okay, so I've heard this a lot lately. It is way harder to stay focused when you're working at home versus your office or a coffee shop or wherever it is that you normally work. The lack of separation between your work and your personal life, not to mention lots of additional distractions floating around, means that your home is kind of like the final boss of difficult workspaces. Well, no, that would probably be a Chuck E. Cheese, actually. But still, today I wanna to talk about how you can actually stay focused on your work, not to mention get started on it in the first place when you're working from home. And first, we need to talk about intentionality. Potentially, the most useful thing you can do when you sit down to work is to set a strong intention first. If you're anything like me, I'm sure you can think back to a time when you sat down and instead of working intentionally, you found yourself bouncing between mostly useless busy work tasks. Things like answering your email or checking your credit score. How is this even possible? These tasks are easy and they give you an immediate feeling of accomplishment. So they're tempting to work on, but they also cause you to procrastinate on the work that you really should be doing, the work that's truly meaningful to you. So really they often end up being a net negative and setting a strong intention before you work helps you to avoid them at least until the real work is done. Now, one useful way of setting intentions is to follow the rule of three. This is a concept from Chris Bailey's book, The Productivity Project, and it's really simple. When you're writing out your daily plan, choose no more than three meaningful tasks that you intend to get done. And if you write your daily list on a whiteboard like I do, then you might wanna tweak how you use it by writing these three intentions at the top and then listing any smaller tasks below them in a deprioritized way. Don't worry about those until you get the main intentions taken care of. Then when it's time to sit down for a session of focused work, look at your list and choose just one item to work on. Really mentally commit to devoting this working session only to that item. And just like that, you now have a strong intention that will help to guide you and keep you on task. Or at least you would if you happen to be sitting in an empty room in like a monastery with no phone or internet access or anything else to distract you. But since you're at home, I would wager that your environment is absolutely teeming with distractions. And if your intentions are gonna be translated into action, then these need to be dealt with. There's just no getting around it. And that has to deal with how your brain is wired. The human brain has evolved over millions of years to be a highly sensitive instrument, ever attentive to the small changes in a constantly shifting and often dangerous environment. And while this has enabled the very survival of our species, it has also made a lot of people very angry and has been widely regarded as a bad move. And that is, not least of which, because it renders us easily distracted when we're trying to do complex work, even if we set a strong intention beforehand. Because meaningful work is hard, because it requires us to really tax our higher brain functions, we are naturally resistant to doing it and we'll take any excuse to fixate on something else. Additionally, our brains also have what's called a built-in novelty bias. Even when we're not resisting difficult tasks, we are drawn to new things, kind of like flies to a light bulb. An analogy can be found in an observation that I made back when I was in middle school. See, when I was a student, I used to carry a pack of chewing gum in my pocket for you know, myself. And anytime that I would get a piece of gum out, again, for myself, any one of my classmates who saw the pack of gum come out of my pocket would stop what they were doing and instantly become a mooch. I will literally die if you do not give me a piece of that right now. And saying the word no to any of these classmates was like hitting them in the face with a brick. The wounded looks in their eyes told me that in denying them that stick of big red, I had ripped apart their dreams, torn their hopes to ribbons, and extinguished every spark of happiness and joy that had kept them pushing forward in this cruel, cruel world thus far. And yet, 
seconds before this exchange would happen, not one of those classmates was thinking about chewing gum. It hadn't even crossed their mind. And this is how our brains work. We have this novelty bias, but of course a novel object has to be brought to our attention for it to be engaged. Out of sight, out of mind. It's why marketers and advertisers talk so much about the ADA framework. Attention, interest, desire, and action. It's the order of operations that governs most of the actions we take, including the ones that lead us to indulging in distractions. Also, if you don't chew Big Red, then fortunately, you can use this knowledge of human psychology to your advantage. If you know that being merely exposed to a potential distraction is gonna put you aboard the Beta Express on a one-way journey to wasting the rest of the day and looking at more cat pictures than you probably need to, then all you need to do is ensure that you aren't exposed in the first place. So, Anna was going to help me film a skit for this part of the video. Then, she fell victim to the worst distraction in the entire house. In other words, remove any potential distractions before you start working. Dealing with them ahead of time is infinitely easier than trying to fight them in the moment. I swear I'm just getting footage to make this point more visual. Six hours later. Now, you're not always going to be able to do this. Chris Bailey's book, Hyperfocus, breaks distractions down into four different categories based on whether or not you have control over them and whether you find them fun or annoying. And those that you have no control over, like loud colleagues, construction noises, or calls from your mom, are hard to plan for ahead of time. The best you can do is to deal with them while keeping your original intention in mind and then get back on track as quickly as possible. But the distractions that you can control can also be dealt with in advance. And let's start with your phone because it's probably the worst offender. Now, in the past, I have been a bit soft on phones. Put it on do not disturb, I said. Use features like focus mode on Android or screen time on iOS to simply limit the time when you can access distracting apps. But you know what? I think it's time to get a little bit tougher. If you don't need your phone for your work, and let's face it, you probably don't, then keep it out of arm's reach. Personally, I've been setting my phone to do not disturb mode for most of the day and also putting it on the printer at the other side of my office. So again, it's out of arm's reach. I also have it set so my favorite contacts can get through do not disturb so my phone does actually work as a phone, but everyone else gets silenced along with all app notifications. Your computer is also a huge potential distraction and that is mostly due to the fact that it's connected to the internet. And if that's a particularly big problem for you, then you might wanna actually disconnect it when you don't need it, either by disabling your Wi-Fi or by actually unplugging the ethernet cable. Barring that, there is one rule that I highly recommend you follow. Don't keep email or any instant messaging apps like Slack or Telegram or whatever, Microsoft Teams, whatever it is, don't keep any of these open while you work. These are constant sources of novelty, so they are distracting by nature, but they also come with the additional social pressure that you feel to respond to a message when it comes in. Personally, I'm part of several different Slack groups, and over the past few months, I've gotten into the bad habit of keeping them open while I was working. And I realized that I would sometimes spend entire work days just chatting with people. So now I only check Slack and email at specific times of the day, and I respond to everything in batches. To remove other computer-based distractions, you can look into getting a distraction blocker, which will block any websites or apps that you put onto a block list. I use one called Freedom, which can be set up to block sites during pre-scheduled windows of time throughout the day or enabled for timed work sessions. Now, I'm not gonna spend a ton of extra time talking about apps here, but if you're looking for other ones that can help you focus, I've recently published a page on my website called the Focus Toolkit, which recommends several more, and I'll have that linked in the description down below. Lastly, since you're at home, ask yourself if there are any other potential sources of distraction that are particular pain points for you that you should address. Like maybe your game consoles are a temptation. Well, if that's the case, put the power cord in another room until you're done with your work. Make it inconvenient to access them so you don't do it impulsively. I'd also recommend keeping a distraction journal nearby. And whenever something pulls you away from your work, make a note of what it was and why it pulls you away so you can figure out how to eliminate it in advance the next time you sit down. Now, once you've taken care of all those distractions, the last thing you need to figure out how to do is to get rid of the resistance you feel towards starting. And this is serious. Mental resistance towards difficult tasks is a big issue. For just one example, there was once a study done on people who felt high levels of anxiety towards doing math. 
And the study found that the mere anticipation of having to do math caused increased brain activity in some specific regions of the brain, namely those that deal with threat detection and even physical pain. Ah! And what this illustrates is that certain parts of our brain view difficult, mentally taxing tasks in the same way they would view touching a hot stove burner. Fortunately, this aversion that you feel towards difficult tasks really only affects you at the beginning. Once you get into it, you build up momentum that overcomes that resistance. So all you need to do is to reduce your resistance enough to get started. And you do this by making the task feel less daunting. Now, the first method for doing that is to break down your tasks. In other words, narrow the scope of your intention. Earlier on in the video, we talked about setting an intention by choosing one of the three meaningful tasks on your daily plan. But if those tasks feel too big, then simply break one down into smaller chunks. That way you can pick one of those chunks and set it as your intention instead. For example, when I sit down to write, I never set my intention as write a video script. Instead, I create multiple subheadings based on an outline, and then I sit down with the intention of writing a draft of just a single section. Now, if I push forward into more sections during that writing session, great, but that is not my intention when I'm starting out. Secondly, commit to working only for a specific period of time and make it low enough that you no longer feel resistance. So if 30 minutes feels like too much, then go for 15. Now, whatever time you do decide to go with, set it on a timer or at least put it on a timer app. Using one of these tools creates a little bit of external pressure. So there's one less thing that you have to rely on your willpower, your internal self-control to handle. So now you have all the tools and the concepts that you should need to sit down and do some focused work. But if you'd like to see an example, here is exactly how I do it. First, I will look at my whiteboard, which now lists my top three intentions separately from other smaller tasks. And if each of these is too big for a single work session, I will choose part of one and set my intention based on that. Next, I choose how long I'm going to work. And lately that has been about 35 minutes per session, at least for starters, which means that the very next thing I do is set a 35 minute block timer on freedom and choose a block list that supports the task. For writing a video or for doing research, I use my morning block list, which blocks Slack, email, all social media, YouTube, and any busy work sites like Google Analytics, which are a pretty big distraction for me personally. Then I'll choose something to listen to, which lately has been either the focus sessions on brain.fm or or my Sunday study playlist on Spotify, which I'll link to down below. And finally, I set an actual timer in a little Mac toolbar app called Be Focused. This takes all of 30 seconds. And in that time, I've done everything we mentioned here. I've set an intention, I've removed all distractions ahead of time, and I've eliminated my brain's aversion to starting by choosing a manageable time for my timer. And I found that doing these few things enables me to stay focused for much longer and it helps me to be a lot more productive. And it makes sense, right? Once you've taken the big problem that seems so difficult to solve, the problem of not being able to focus and broken it down, you're left with just a few smaller, easier to solve problems. And these quick actions neatly take care of each one. And it's worth remembering that all problems are like this. Once you've broken them down into smaller parts, you start to see little angles of attack that you can take for applying useful solutions. And doing this is a skill that you can get better at through practice. And one great resource for getting that practice is Brilliant. The math, science, and computer science courses on Brilliant are all built to engage your problem solving abilities as they quickly throw you into challenges that force you to really interact with the concepts you're learning. And not only does learning with Brilliant help you to become a better problem solver, since you're spending the majority of your time actively solving problems, but it can also help you to get ahead and understand the world more thoroughly. Brilliant's library features more than 60 in-depth courses with a full math suite that covers everything from basic number theory to high level probability, along with science and computer science courses. And that includes a new course on neural networks, which are a fundamental part of artificial intelligence. So to start learning and building your problem solving skills today, head on over to brilliant.org slash Thomas Frank and sign up. Link will be in the description down below. And if you're one of the first 200 people to do that, you're even gonna get 20% off your annual premium subscription. So that is it. Thank you so much for watching. And if you like this video, definitely hit that like button to show YouTube's algorithm what's up. And you may also want to go follow me over on Instagram because uh, today I've actually put up a little bonus video with an additional tip for dealing with a particular type of distraction that I know a few of you deal with on a regular basis. So check that out. Link will be in the description down below. Otherwise you can subscribe right there or check out one more video on this channel right over here. Probably. I think this is where the button's going to be. Uh, yeah. Smash your face into it and watch some more videos, dude. Otherwise, go do whatever you want, because as always, I'm not your dad.